Hey church family, welcome to Cornerstone. I'm Brandon Vyeth, discipleship and young adult pastor, and I'm excited for us to worship and pursue God's presence together today. Whether you've been coming for a while or today's your first visit, on campus or online, we're so glad that you're joining us. If you're a visitor, we would love to connect with you and help you find community. For all our in-person guests, we have connect cards in the seat back in front of you. You can fill out the card and bring it to the info center in the lobby for a welcome gift after the service. Our info center volunteers are also available to help anyone with questions or ways to connect with our community. If you are a guest watching online, visit the helpful connection links below this video. We would love to hear from you. Cornerstone, we believe in the importance and the power of prayer. Whether it be a request or a praise report, we want to come alongside you in speaking directly with God. If you want to pray with the whole church family, we have whiteboards in the hallway where you can write out your prayers. If you need someone to pray over you today, there's a dedicated prayer room with volunteers available to hear your story. Even if you're online, we have a pastor waiting to pray with you in real time or reach out on our website link below. No matter how you share your need, your prayer requests will be specifically prayed for and handled confidentially. We believe that another way we worship God is by giving back a portion of what He has so generously given to us. Your financial support allows our church to better serve God and serve others both here in our local community and throughout the world. If you're new or visiting, your gift to us is you being here today. But if you call Cornerstone your church home and have come prepared to give, we have several opportunities for you to give as shown on the screen. We can't thank you enough for your faithful giving. As you can see, God is doing some awesome things here at Cornerstone. We'd love for you to jump in and be a part of it. Worship is going to begin soon, so take a few seconds to focus your attention on the Lord. Thanks again for being with us today. Good morning, Cornerstone. So good to see you this morning on this nice fall morning. The winds are blowing, the leaves are falling, the sun is shining. It's a new season, and God wants to always bring new seasons in our life. So welcome. My name's Don. I'm one of the pastors here. So good to have you all. And if you're in the loft, a big shout out to all our loft folks up there. And if you're part of our online community, God bless you and welcome aboard. And if you happen to be first-time guest here, one of the things we ask our first-time guests is right in front of you in the seat back, there's what we call a connect card. We just invite you to fill that out. And you could do one of two things with it. You could either drop it in any of the boxes outside of our door, offering boxes, or could take it to the information center, which is in the lobby. And you can get a free gift there, which is really neat, but we also get a chance to say hello to you that way. So if you're a first-time guest, welcome to Cornerstone. We know the service will be a blessing to you today. And also today, we're going to dedicate some children to the Lord today. It'll be an exciting time for children, their parents... Maybe, maybe not the children, they may not know, but the parents sure do and the family members will. But it's actually a holy time where we present our children to God. So that's going to be a great time. Also, on Monday, I just want to thank all the people that went to Harrisburg. We had busloads went to Harrisburg for the March for Life. And it's a time where we would stand with those who want to protect the unborn. Those that don't have a voice, we're a voice for them. And um, I think Cornerstone made a statement there along with others, but it was a time where we stood in solidarity with those that don't have a voice. So thank you all for those that, that did that. In the meantime, we're going to have some video announcements here, so take a look at those. Lots of stuff going on at Cornerstone, so God bless you, and let this service be a blessing to your heart today. Hi, I'm Sarah, the Assistant Children's Ministry Director, and I'm here to talk about Operation Christmas Child. The Samaritan's Purse Project, also known as Operation Christmas Child, 
collects shoebox gifts filled with fun toys, school supplies, and hygiene items, and delivers them to children in need around the world to demonstrate God's love in a tangible way. For many of these children, the gift, a filled shoebox, is the first gift they have ever received. The boxes are delivered through local churches, and that gives them an opportunity to share about Jesus Christ and God's love. So for the next couple of weeks, Cornerstone will give you an opportunity to pack a box and join in on spreading the love of Jesus to some of the most remote regions of the world. We also would like to invite any child from kindergarten to grade five to our Operation Christmas Child Packing Party on Saturday, November 11th from 11 to one. The children get to pack their very own shoe boxes that will then be shipped all around the world. Our goal is to pack 150 shoe boxes for kids in need. We will also have crafts and pizza for the kids to enjoy. Come enjoy a day filled with fun and serving the Lord. Hey everyone, I'm standing here in our lobby next to our sign with our core values, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen, but I wonder how many of you have stopped and wondered what they all mean. Well, I want to invite you to come to our membership class Sunday, November 5th from 1230 to 4 p.m., where we're going to dig into what we believe and why we function the way that we do. Paul uses the Greek word koinonia, which means co-laborers in the gospel. We want to have incredible unity as we further the kingdom of God together. So sign up online, and we hope to see you at membership. Hi, I'm Mark Thomas, pastor of Outreach here at Cornerstone. And if you notice on your calendar falls upon us, and Christmas is just around the corner. And with Christmas at Cornerstone comes Angel Tree and Christmas Food Basket. So if you or someone you know are facing economic challenges, you can stop by the Information Center after services and pick up an application. Deadline is November 12th, and our distribution is Saturday, December 16th. So I'd encourage you, if you're in need, come by the Information Center, fill out an application, and we'll see you on December 16th. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. We're glad you're here with us. Would you stand with me? We're going to worship. Come on, let's put our hands together here today. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God. Quiet. 
Come on, let's give him praise here this morning. There's joy in the house of the Lord, amen? Come on, there's joy in the house of the Lord, amen? Yeah, man, we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed. That's good news today, isn't it? Um, Church family, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And uh, it's great to be able to take some time and just lift our voices in worship and in gratitude for who the Lord is and for what he's done. And as you know, we're in the middle of our all church series, our our King series. And um, as we were doing some planning, this song just, just rose to the surface. And, um, and it, it, it just helps us say a few things. It's a, it's a great song that, that goes along with our King series that speaks of the majesty and the glory and the, the honor of God, the holiness of the Lord, and our, our place of surrender to the Lord. And so I would invite you, as Jeremy leads us in this today, help, me, help us sing it out. And uh, you'll pick it up quick and just worship the Lord with it. It's going to be a, a, a time where we just lay ourselves before him and let him do what he does. Let's sing. Enthroned in glory, my Savior King. Your loving kindness has welcomed me. Though I'm unworthy. Of majesty, you wrap the lowly in royalty. Yes, I will lay my crowns down at your because you are holy.
Come on, let's give him praise. Yes, God, we just continue our worship. I've got a friend closer than a brother. There is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me. I've got a friend. He is my strength. He is my portion. He's with me in the valley, with me in the fire, with me in the storm. Let all God is good, amen. He is a great father. He is a friend. He loves us. He really does love us, amen. Come on, let's give him praise one more time. Ooh, God is good. We're so blessed to be able to, to worship him freely here. We're so glad you're here with us today. 
We have a very special morning. We're going to have some baby dedications, some super cuteness coming up here. So if you have a baby that's getting dedicated, you can come forward. And as they're coming forward, say hi to someone. Tell them you're happy to see them. Shake some hands. Have a seat. Morning, church. Where are you? There I'm right you are. here. <laughs> I'm Jenny Marsley, the children's ministry director, and one of the joys of my job is to get to meet new little babies that God brings into the world. And so I get to introduce these three great families to you. First, right next to me, we have Lauren Metz, and she is dedicating her son Maverick Lee. Can you say hi? Yeah, so this is little Maverick. And then next to them, we have the Zimmer family. This is Tyler and Kaylee, and they are dedicating Franco Vincent to the Lord. Franco. And I just have to do this plug. They met outside of church, but they got close while they were serving together at the warehouse. So for all of you who are single, serving is the way to go. And I have a spot for you in children's ministry, but we're really excited to see them growing in their faith and bringing their little one to the Lord. And then finally over here, we have the Giuliano family. This is Adam and Amy, and they are dedicating their second son, Mason Wayne, to the Lord. And we have older brother Noah looking on. Wow, good job, Jenny. Yeah, amen that was, I heard it, yeah. How are you? You guys really picked up. Horrible time to have kids. If you've watched the news lately, it's, uh, I'm just kidding. It's always a good time because it's in God's plan. But this are days and age. I think we have some days ahead of us when uh, we need to be bold about our faith. We need to tell our kids very clearly about Jesus and how he saved us and how we need to love him and seek God's will for our lives. And then the other thing is, I just want to assure you that uh, there's re- the Bible's really clear, Deuteronomy 6, that the responsibility before God for raising our kids to love God uh, falls on parents. But the church has a real role to come alongside you. We get to cheer. Uh, we get to hopefully bring pr- programs and so forth. But We just want to back you up in every way we can because no matter what else we do as a church, and there's a lot of wonderful things we're doing, but the one that matters the most to me is I want to see our kids eventually. I want to have a long life here, but I want to see them with us in heaven. And that means more to me than anything else. And so we have these vows that you're going to take right now. Friend, as you bring this child before the part of the body of Christ of which Uh, he has made you a part, do you confess your faith in our Savior Jesus Christ? And are you fully committed to his will for your life and for your home? If you are, say, I am. And then number two, do you therefore accept as both a duty and a privilege to live a life before this child that reflects the holiness of Jesus? And will you give disciplined care that he or she be taught a taught the scriptures and the essentials of the Christian faith and learn to give priority to both the private and the public worship of our awesome God. If you do, say, I do. And number three, will you make every possible effort to keep your child under the ministry and guidance of the church so that we may be your partners in working towards the day when these precious children will accept for themselves the gift of salvation by faith and become a fully committed disciple of Jesus Christ, seeking his will and his plan for their life. If you are will do that, say I will. All right. I think I'm going to start over here. I don't know. How are we doing? Remind me of his name? Mason. I'd like you all to meet Mason. Look at him looking. Isn't he nice? Say him, Mason, to all your fans out there. Look at them. Would you stretch out your arms as a representative of the body of Christ? And uh, let's pray for Mason. Father God, we thank you for Mason. We thank you that you made him perfect for the plan you have for his life. 
I pray, Lord, for, for the household in which he grows up, that Jesus would be Lord there and be a place of peace and joy, but also truth. And I pray, Lord, that as he grows, he'll come to know you as his Lord and Savior. And we pray, Lord, that this young man will do great exploits for the kingdom of God. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. He's a keeper, I'll tell you. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> you turn and he turns. Hello there. Oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. This is, remember his first name. This is Franco. Okay. Yeah. Say hi to all your friends out there. Will you stretch out your hand? Father God, thank you for Franco. He's a beautiful boy. And I thank you for the way you've made him and the family you've placed him in. And we ask, Lord, for your will to be unfolded in his life. And we just commit him to you, Lord, and, and, to, and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. You got him. All right. How's this going to work? Come and see me. Uh, come and see me. Whoa. Look at here. Look at your people out here. Say hi. Say hi. Okay, we're going to pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful boy. Thank you for all the energy that you've given him. And Lord, we look forward to the day when he'll take that tenacity and that faith and that boldness and apply it to his faith as he stands for you. Lord, I just pray that your hand would be upon him in his home and we just commit him to you and ask you to do mighty works in him and then great exploits through him. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We did wonderful. Good job. That's all I got. Thank you. Oh, God bless you. Oh, we're here, church. We want, you, we want to see these kids grow up to love Jesus, and we want to be your partners in that. Thank you. God bless you. to have you with us just to kind of let you know what we're doing. You might have seen the timeline in the lobby or maybe a bulletin that you have, but we're looking at the kings of Judah, the southern kingdom after the division of the kingdom in, in what God can teach us. You know, the, the king, a king is just a human being like you. The only difference is that they are sort of living their life with a spotlight on them standing on a stage. Every good thing they do gets noticed and written down, and every bad thing they do gets noticed and written down. And nothing could be further, be closer to the truth of that than the guy we get to meet today, Uzziah. He's really become one of my favorites as I uh, studied uh, his life today because, man, when he was good, he was incredible. And when he was bad, well, it was rough. And so we're going to talk to you about Uzziah today. But before we get, and just if you want to know, this one's really easy to study if you want to look a little deeper. Because if you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, that's the whole story. And it's there in one chapter, and it's easy to read. And uh, it's an amazing thing. But to make sense out of it, we kind of have to go back just a page or two to his father. Now, his father's name was Amazah. And Amazah was the uh, king of, of, of Judah before, before Uzziah. But he was a weak king. The Bible describes him this way. You know, we have the dark on, if you look at the pictures on the, out on the lobby, we have black for uh, bad kings and gold for good kings. Well, this guy, it says, you, you, it says that he loved God but not with his whole heart. He was one of those, go to church and raise your hand and do it, but really never really fully devoted himself to the God who had made him king. And so the story goes like this, that when he was king, he, uh, 
he, he was feeling his Wheaties one day, and he decided to attack another nation that they were at war with, Edom. And they had a great victory there. They fought the Edomites, and, and they won, and they took great plunder in all of that. And they gave God the glory and said it was a great thing. But then Amazing did, amaz- did, a, did a dumb thing. Coming home, he, he challenges the king of the northern kingdom uh, to, a, to come out and fight. And the, and the guy that was the head of the northern kingdom uh, Jehoash was his Jehoash. You got to put the hoe in there. Jehoash was the king. He'd been king for a long time, and he was very powerful. And he had built up his army. And Amaziah had nothing like the army that the northern kingdom had at that time. And he wrote back. He said, "I don't really want to fight you. We're relatives." He said, "But uh, you aren't ready to fight us. You you want a game, but you were playing single A ball, and this is the majors. And if you come up against us, yeah." We're going to beat you. We don't really want to fight with you. But, but the king, wouldn't, Amazer, wouldn't lay down. He just wouldn't lay it down. Finally, he marched out, and the northern kingdom sent its army out and just knocked the snot out of them, to be frank about it. And there wasn't hardly any, anything left. And then you know what he did? He followed them after he had beat the army. When they turned to retreat, he followed them all the way back to Jerusalem. And when he gets back to Jerusalem, he, he knocks a 60-foot hole in the wall. The wall was the protective wall around Jerusalem. And, and he just tore it down and brought his army in through that big hole he made. And they went to the king's palace, and they took everything out of the palace that was of any value. All the coins, all the silver, all the gold, anything like that, they plundered. And then they went over to the temple. And they did the same thing. They took all of the offerings, all of the things that were made out of gold, the utensils that they used in worship and so forth. They took it all and they left. Amazing was so weakened by that that for 15 years he's king and he's never even gotten the wall built back up. And the people were tired of feeling uh, unsafe and they were tired of being the laughing stock of the other nations. And so... Uh, Amazer was killed, not by the enemy, but an internal coup in, in the southern kingdom. They, they assassinated him. And when they assassinated him, his 16-year-old son becomes the king. And his 16-year-old son is, Amaza, or is uh, Uzziah, who we're going to talk about today. So I just want you to know where he's coming from. When he becomes the king, uh, first of all, there's still a big hole in the wall. So every predator out there that wants to come in and f- take over and plunder them, it's, they can do it. And it's been that way for years. Secondly, his dad was assassinated. And the people that are in charge, he doesn't know if the people that are in charge of him, you know, if you're 16, you're not going to really be in charge. There has to be some people behind the scenes that are going to want to use you as a front man, and they're going to run the country. And so, and, and guess what? If you don't do what they tell you, remember what happened to your dad. So that's the position with which he comes into power. And I just wanted you to see that as, as, as we uh, start to, to look at this. So I want you to, to, to uh, here's what, uh, it's fascinating to me. There's one little thing I want to say first. It's amazing how this passage starts. All the people of Judah uh, had crowned Amazing king, 16-year-old, Uzziah as king in place of his father, after his father's death. And then look at the first thing it says. It says, Uzziah built the town of Elath and restored it to Judah. Now, that's an amazing thing to start out with. Now, it's going to talk about other um, battles and, and, and that the, that. Uzziah had when he was king. He was very victorious in other battles. But it's interesting to me that right off the bat, in the first sentence almost, it tells you that he, he as soon as he was in power, they attacked Elath. Now, I've got to put a map up here for you. See, here's, here's Judah, our kingdom, and here's the northern kingdom. And I want you to notice something. Here is the Philist, where the Philistines are. You know what we call that today? Gaza. Isn't it amazing how things change, but they stay the same? The, the name Ashdod is in this same chapter we're studying as it is will be on the news tonight. It's just the more it changes, the more it stays the same. So it's, they, the reason that this battle is singled out is they attacked the Philistines. The Philistines were always the hardest people for the Israelites to win battles against. They gave David fits, but Solomon really did finally wipe them out. 
uh, as far as living here. But as soon as the kingdom is divided, they move in. And here's where the Philistines are. Uh, in, in what this, the, about this much of it down is modern-day Gaza. Now, this was really important because I want you to notice. See, here's the sea. And Philistia stands between Judah and the Mediterranean Sea. Do you know what that meant? After Solomon is gone and the kingdom divides, the southern kingdom is landlocked. They have no access to the sea. You know what that means? That means they couldn't be involved in commercial trading. And so the first thing they do when he becomes in power is the first thing they do is they take this land so that they can have commerce. With Uzziah was the, the, of all the kings that we'll study, he was the one who not only cared about military victory, but about commercial victory, commerce, that, that the people have a way to make a greater living. And so they needed things that could be traded. There's a great road that goes clear to India that, that goes by here, the road by the sea. And great commerce, both coming on boats and coming on by the road that goes beside it. And Judah now becomes a player in commerce. And that was one of the first things that Uzziah did. Now let's go back. And read, um, here they are, found them. Let's read um, Second Chronicles chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all of his father Amaza had done. He set, him, he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God, as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. A couple of things there I want you to look about. Like I said, he's 16 years old, but he, God gives him a gift by a man named Zechariah. We don't know anything else about him. This isn't the one that the book's named after in the later part of the Old Testament. This is just another, lots of people had that name. But the, there was a guy named Zechariah, and I think he was the voice behind the throne for at least the first half of Uzziah's uh, reign. He's the one making those decisions. He's probably the one that says, we need to go to Ellen and take that city quick. And, and they did. And he is guiding him. But he is also a godly man. And he's a man of the Bible. And he wants, he wants to teach all of, that, all of that to Uzziah. So Uzziah, Zechariah is a, a big player, especially in the early days. Now, I can't prove this, but I can think this. I got a feeling we're going to get to a place where Uzziah was an incredible king, an incredible king, and then he falls off, and because of pride, he loses everything. I wonder where, Uzziah, where Zechariah dies. I wonder if it's after Zechariah is gone and is no longer there to mentor him that he gets into trouble. But that's, that's how it starts out, and he is an amazing king. Um, he, as I said, he opens the door for, con for commerce, which uh, never had been done. Uh, he, he, he's, he, his, his resume is incredible. I'd like to have this guy working for me. So after he gets the commerce gone, you know what? He becomes, a, he becomes a great military success. And really, it never tells us of a military battle that he fought, that he lost. Uh, he, he did that real... Uh, and, and he was a commercial success. The Bible says this about him. I don't think this is about anybody else in the Bible. It says, he loved the soil. You gardeners out there, this guy's your patron saint. He loved the, I wish he'd come to my house. I got some tomato patch needs cleaned out a little. But he, he, he realized, if I'm going to care for these people, the first thing you have to have is food. And that was a big deal back then. And so he did amazing things. First of all, he understood the land. He understood where you planted olive trees and where you put vineyards, how that would, you didn't want that down in the valleys. You wanted that on the side of the hill. And so he, he instructed in how to get the greatest uh, return on, on the stuff that they were growing. And then secondly, he did something no one else had ever done before, at least in Israel, and that was that he dug wells. Now, they dug wells next to their cities, but he's the first one who said, we don't just need wells next to our cities. That's for people. We need to dig wells and build cisterns where there's runoff for our livestock. And he had a jumongous amount of 
cattle and sheep and goats. And, and that meant the people had something to eat. And it was more than ever before. And, and so he just he did that, uh, working the soil his, with his own hands and then enhancing the livestock. And you can imagine, one commentator I read said that we're going to look at Jehoshaphat in a couple of weeks, that Jehoshaphat is the only of the, one of these kings we're studying who brought prosperity to the country of, of southern kingdom more than our Uzziah did. So he, he made the things better for anyone. And then uh, he, he not only, he, he, the way he treated his army was amazing. He, would, he could have taught at the war college. I mean, he brilliant about the way he treated them. He looked at his pen. There's no record when, the, you know, the king had the right to go to any household and say, I want your son to fight in my army. They, you could conscript anybody you wanted if you were the king. They, lo- they literally belonged to you to go to war. But you know, there's never any record that when the kings would conscript the people to go to war, that, he, that the kings would ever equip them. And so literally you would find your, your 18-year-old son who's been ca- taking care of your livestock at home, the king comes in and takes him and says, I'm putting him in the army. You know what they never did? They never gave him a weapon. And so you, 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 you would see these young men going into battle against trained troops on the other side, and they're carrying a pitchfork. Or sometimes they only have a, have a stick that they're going out into battle for. And that doesn't exactly build confidence, you know. But when Uzziah comes... Listen to what he does. He equips his entire army. He had 300,000 soldiers in his army, and he had 2,600 special forces. And that was, it's a brilliant thing. He, uh, he did some amazing things. This is the first time we saw divisions in an army. You know how, like in World War, like in the Civil War, you would see that it was the first Pennsylvania and the third Delaware, and, and how those people coming from the same area could be in the same group to fight and hold each other up. Well, he did that then. He took the elders from the different tribes, and he had them be heads over different parts of the army. And that built tremendous confidence in, in one another to have your brother and your uncle and your cousin around you. And then he equipped the army like no one before him. Look at uh, verse 4 of chapter 26 of Second Chronicles. Uzziah prepared for all the army... Uh, and I you know, prepared for all the army shields. This is what he gives to every, every soldier in his army gets a shield... They get spears, they get helmets, they get coats of mail. You know, not bulletproof vests, but arrowproof vests. Think of that. In those days, that was a big deal. Only the, only the, uh, the, the rich and the famous had those, but he gave them to everyone in his army. They had bows and stones for slinging. Uh, thrown, you know, David wasn't the only one with a slingshot. That was a part of, their, of what they fought with. Uh, and so all of this is going on. And then verse 15, I don't know, this really excited me. You may not think it's as exciting as I do, but in verse 15 is an amazing verse. Listen to what it says. In Jerusalem, Uzziah made machines invented by skillful men to be on the towers And the corners to shoot arrows and great stones. And his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped till he he was strong. That means as he's growing up, there's incredibly skilled people around him. Look at this. He made machines. I think that's a fascinating line to find in the Old Testament. That were invented by skillful men. And so... It sounds from this, if you read this carefully, it sounds like he was the first one in that whole region, you know, from Egypt uh, to Babylon, to use catapults when he built his walls. Remember the wall had been torn down? Well, when he rebuilt the wall, he realized that the walls had been built at the most vulnerable places for Israel to be attacked. So you know what he did? When he rebuilt the walls, he didn't just rebuild the wall. He built a tower at every place where the, where the uh, had been torn down. He, he deliberately said, you made this weak. We'll make it the strongest spot. And so he had all these towers where the weak spots were, and he turned the weakest thing into the strongest thing. And then he built these machines. And 
uh, it sounds like he had guys in, in his army who would come to him and he could he one thing about a great leader is they're a good listener do you know that and the guys would come to him with their little sketches you know and they'd say look uh, i could build this thing that could throw throw 50 pound rock 100 yards and if we start throwing those at the enemy, he may not want to come any closer. And then it sounds like they, feel, they felt some other kind of a machine, not a catapult that shows stones, but something that would shoot multiple arrows, that they could load a thing that would shoot arrows into the enemy's line. Uh, I, I just think that's fine. It teaches me that, that not only was he creative and inventive, oh, and he did one other thing. When they were rebuilding the wall and putting the stones up, the Bible says that they figured out a way to put holes in the, in the stones where you could shoot your bow, your arrow out, but it's only a hole this big for the enemy to shoot back at you. So you didn't have to get your head up out of the, out of where this much of you is exposed when you're shooting an arrow. And so this is why clear down in Egypt, they are saying, this is marvelous. And I, I, I also want to just tell you that this shows not only the creativity that he had, but it also shows that he was a great leader, because great leaders are great listeners. And I love that the, something that uh, Jim Wall, who was the head of the Australian Special Forces for years, he said, leadership is maximizing other people's potential. We think of a leader as somebody who can do everything well himself. Nobody's that good. And if you are a really wise leader, you will learn to, he to figure out the people you have on your team that have special gifts and talents and abilities and insights, engineers, and you'll turn them free. And they'll come up with catapults when no one's heard of it yet and machines that shoot multiple arrows. Now, he was a great leader. So... Judah was the most popular, was the most prosperous during Josiah's reign, save maybe for uh, when Jehoshaphat was in power. And so he was an incredible guy. I mean, can you imagine if you if you I, I, wouldn't you want to live in Israel during that time? When it has safety because you got the best army, it's growing the most crops so that you know Israel didn't have the big trees. Lebanon had all the big trees, but Lebanon didn't have fields where they could grow wheat and barley and so forth. So now, as they get sourced to a port and as they get sourced to the great road that ran, they could go to all the other countries around them, and they could trade the, the crops that they were growing for the things that they needed. And it was a great time. So he, he was a popular leader, and he was an amazing man doing a great job. So what happened? Well, it's verse 16 that I want you to look at. But when he had become powerful, he also became proud. Wow. First, they talked about the Egyptians, and they said he had fame. He became famous. And when you become famous, you don't worry about what the little people around you think. You worry about what are they thinking back at Pharaoh's court, or what are the Babylonians thinking about, or what are other countries think. So you're, you're putting yourself in this leadership class with these other people, highfalutin people from other countries, and pretty soon, uh, he, he had power, and he had, but he had fame, and it led to his downfall. Some translation says it led to his destruction. I just picture him this way. I don't know. I just see him. Uzziah gets up in the morning, and he has to shave. So he looks in the mirror, and he looks in the mirror, and he thinks, boy, God's been good to you. Just think of all the things God's done to you, for you. Praise the Lord. I think he praised the Lord when he was shaving. And then all of a sudden, one day, he looked in the mirror, and he said, Darn, are you good? And instead of giving God the glory, he thought it was him. He thought he'd won all those battles that God had fought for him. He thought all of those ideas. You know, it says in Deuteronomy that it, it, it says in Deuteronomy that all of the talents and ability we have, God gave them to us. Do you believe that? If you can do something really well, that isn't just because you're lucky, it isn't just because you work hard, though you might. It's because God gives out the abilities that we have. And if he's given you some, you need to give him the glory for whatever he does. And so this is where 
Uriah stops giving the praise to God and starts to say, I'm a big shot. And rules are for little people. And I'm above the rules. And so one day, he gets in his chariot. This is how I picture it. And he rides his beautiful big chariot with big white horses down right in front of the temple. He goes from the palace to the temple, the temple of God. And he walks in. And in those days, you know, even in pagan worship, one of the main forms of worship was always burning incense. When you read about the kings that fell, burning incense was a way that they worshiped those days. And so he comes up to the temple. And he does a terrible thing. It doesn't sound really bad to us, but it sounds really bad to God. He gets out of the temple. There is 81 priests standing there. Only the priests were allowed in the holy place. There was outside courtyards. Everyone could be there. But God had said, I'm setting the priests aside for me. And they will all be Aaron, Moses' brother Aaron's descendants. The priesthood is reserved for them. And they, the priest had two big jobs in the holy place. One was they had to change the showbread. Every day, fresh bread was brought in and put on a table. It was to remind them that God was the source of the bread of life. He was the source of all that we need in life. So every day that bread is changed and only the priest could change that. But the other thing was there was, a, there was an altar of incense. And the altar of old incense set right in front of the Holy of Holies. All the priests could go into the holy place. Only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And then only on the Day of Atonement. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where God's presence over Israel was. One guy once a year could go in there. It was a holy, holy place. But outside of it, it's called the holy place. And that's where the priests would burn incense. But see... Uzziah now, he's a big shot. And he knows that rules are for little people, not him. And so he walks past all the priests, goes into the place where everyone's forbidden but the priests, and he gets his own little sensor, incense sensor, and he's putting this incense in it, and he's just about to write, light the fire, and the high priest comes in and says, Uzziah, you don't want to do that. You have to obey God's law. Do things God's way, not your way. And if you do, God will punish you. Well, he's the king. He hasn't anybody tell him what to do since Zechariah died. And so he's, he says, Burr! and he's just ready to just really shout out a bunch of stuff at the high priest. High priest brought 80 other priests with him. I mean, they're, they're trying to make a statement. This is our job. This isn't your job. And just as Uriah is about to, say, to shout back at the priest, you know what happens? He feels something funny on his forehead. And in seconds, he's covered with leprosy. He's covered. God's judgment isn't usually that quick, but it's that thorough. And all of a sudden, everything changed in Uriah's life. This amazing king with all these talents and gifts and ability and, and used so well in his own country. Now he's become a big shot. Now pride is about to destroy him. The Bible says that he fought the high priest about being in there. He was pushing back at him until he felt his forehead and, and then he willfully, with his own will, left the, uh, left the holy place. The Bible tells us the leprosy never went away. Just think about this guy. Just think about this for a minute. One day, he is the most important and the most powerful man in all of the southern kingdom. And the next day, they put a little house behind the palace, a little house. And he's the only one allowed in that house, and he's never allowed. I mean, here he is. He is the king of the whole country, but he's not allowed out of his own front yard. What, what, what a change. And that's the way he lived the rest of his life. Pride led to destruction. And look what it says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with, it, but with the humble is wisdom. Wow. He ran out of wisdom, and then he ran out of grace. And he died insignificant. 
Can you imagine sitting there every day and he's watching his son, who's now the acting king. He kept the title of king, but he, what, he wasn't allowed in a meeting. They were scared to death of leprosy. And so he wasn't literally allowed in a meeting anywhere with anyone else. Even on his tombstone, they wrote a leper so that others wouldn't touch it. And so you can see, can you see him? The people are all coming to worship. He's just watching. He sees the officials come in. They're having meetings where he used to lead them in, in the right direction, and he can't go near the place. And his son is now in power. 51 years. We don't know exactly when, but the last half of it was very like that. A couple of things I want to say to you. Lessons learned. Pride is a sin. And sin separates us. I want you to think about that. When you're proud, you're, you know what you, really, I think that pride is its own form of idolatry. Because what we're really doing is saying, I'm going to sit on the throne of my life. There's no room for God in here. I'll make my own decisions. And we almost worship ourselves. Are we seeing that in our culture? And we call it narcissism more and more. It's about me. It's about me. And God's always saying, no, it's really about me and my plan. And so I, I just, I, I think that there's a tremendous lesson to be learned. You know, there's pride, and the opposite is humility. And humility is a powerful thing. And it's one that we must understand if we're going to understand God. So um, I just... Humility is something I want to talk to you for a few minutes about. You know, the word humility comes in, 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 in all, if you, if you study Latin, if you study Greek, if you study Hebrew, they all mean, it's, it's the word for low, low. That's the word humility, really at root is low. And so it's funny because, you know, you can have humiliation, which is the same root, or you can have humility, uh, the difference is one is negative, one's positive. Humiliation is when somebody else pushes you down. It's when someone says some terrible thing to you in front of your friends to, to humiliate you, or somebody mocks you, or somebody in, overpowers you, or bullies you on the bus, kids, something like that. That's being pushed down. But being humble is an act of your will, it's when you stoop to help others. That's humility. Humility isn't really a feeling. It's a desire to use the authority, the power, the wealth, or whatever you have, not for yourself, but for others. Uh, I, I mentioned the, the book by the, uh, the, um, by uh, John Dixon called Humilitus, which is the Latin for humility. And here's his definition of humility. Humility is the noble choice to forgo your status, deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. I love that. More simply, you could say that the humble person is marked by a willingness to hold power in service of others. Powerful, powerful. And of course, that's interesting for anybody that wants to study. It's essential for those of us who love Jesus Christ. He has called us to humility and to walk that way. And you know, there was a time in the, British, in the uh, Roman Empire when uh, this whole thing was a clash because the Roman Empire, like many empires before it, was built on, on an honor-shame system. You wanted everybody to know everything you, you, you've ever done. Uh, they have you, you can go to Rome and you can see when Julius, Iscariot, or Julius uh, Augustus died, he had these huge, big plaques made. So before you could walk up to his tomb, you had to go through how many wars he fought and how many people he killed and, and how many cities he had liberated and everything about him. He wanted everyone to know all the things he did. And, 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 and you wanted to promote you. Even when he was dead, he was still in the self-promotion business. <laughs> and then there's Jesus. And he's saying, you know, you're not just here for you. You're here to do something good for others. And uh, I love this picture. I've used this before, but I haven't for a couple of years. I want to put this up here. Uh, they were uh, 
the uh, Palatine Hill in Rome, one of the seven hills of Rome. They were doing an archaeological dig one day, and they found this, uh, this drawing. This was on a, uh, a holding, like a prison holding cell in that area where they'd keep prisoners until they went to the bigger prison. And so th- th- this was scratched on the wall. This is a picture of a crucified man, but with a donkey's head like he's a jackass. And, and so this is a picture of Jesus. Although they think Jesus is so dumb, they put a jackass head on him. And then over here is a man standing whose name is Alex Amento. And he's got his arm raised, just like you did today, praising Jesus. And, and in mocking, the man says, Alex Amento worships his God. You see, to a honor-based system, to a system where everyone wants to brag and make themselves better than everyone else, it seems like utter nonsense that you would follow a man who, first of all, was just a commoner, a carpenter, but then he got killed. He died on the cross. He's a failure. He ended up dead. Why would you worship somebody like that? You see, in in a shame-based, an honor-based system. It makes no sense at all. Uh, But in the end, it makes more sense than anything, doesn't it? More sense than anything. Jesus changed the world by giving his life away, by being the one who had power, who had authority, who had all of all of it, but chose to use it not for his own good, but to set us free. And not only does he do it to set us free, but he commands us then that we must be that way too. You know, we're studying a whole bunch of kings, and they're all interesting, but before we started this series, I already had my favorite king. I wonder how many of you already have a favorite king. Can anybody guess what the name of my favorite king is? Jesus. I didn't hear you. Jesus. Hail King Jesus. Hail King Jesus. And so, you know the scripture of the greatest king. Look at Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Paul's writing to the church at Philippi. He says, have this mind among yourselves. That means have this attitude, which is is yours in Christ Jesus. Be like Jesus, who though he was in the form of God. That really means his very essence was God. I could take that chair. I could paint it different colors. I can rip off the upholstery. I can cover it with leather. I can bend the legs. But you know, whatever you do, that's a chair. And it's always going to be a chair. You can't make it into a, something else. It's going to be a chair. You can change things about it, but it's still a chair. God, Jesus could leave the glories of heaven. He could stop being a spirit God and become a God who takes on the enfleshment of a body. He could, he could be a God who in heaven was worshipped, cease for, for all time and turn him into a servant. But he's still God. He couldn't stop being God any more than you could stop being you. And so he, 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 he took his equality with the Father as a thing not to be grasped, but he willingly emptied himself of all the glory that he had in heaven by taking on the form of a servant, by being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself, there's our word, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You want to know humility? Just look at the cross and see Jesus. One of the things that jumped out at me as I was preparing for this was that both the two places where I looked uh, in, the, in the Bible, uh, the reason it talks about the humility of Jesus is because it's telling us that's how God wants us to live too. I just want you to look. This is verse 5. We'll go back to verse 3 to 4, the verses right before that. Paul's talking to, to the Christians about how they're to live, and he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves, lest each of you look not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. Huh. So, when we read the thing about Jesus being God become a man to die for our sin, you see what we're really doing is 
Paul's giving us the reason that we too must walk in humility and use our lives to benefit others. When the church does that, you can't build them big enough. And when the church becomes about us and our pride, any little place will do. One more illustration and I'll be done. Philipp, or in Mark chapter 10, verse 42 to 45. This, the context of this is that uh, James and John, the sons of thunder, these two disciples of Jesus, the brothers, they, uh, they pull Jesus aside one day because they believe that his kingdom is going to be an earthly kingdom coming right now. And they know Jesus is going to be the king, so the center seat is full. But then, the, you know, you sit around the conference table, the, the most important two seats next to Jesus will be the one on either side of him, Right? So they're saying, yeah, Jesus, we see that you've got these other guys here, but they're not as, you know, they're, they're, they're not in the same league with James and I, John says. So he said, we're just wondering, when you establish your kingdom and you take that center seat on the throne, could we have one of us sit on your left hand and one right on your right hand? And the other disciples hear this and they go, say what? And pretty soon, the whole place is they're arguing and bickering with each other about who's the greatest and who's the most and all of that. And here's Jesus' answer. He called them together and said, be quiet. You know that those who are considered rulers by the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must first be the servant. And whoever would be first among you must be the slave to all. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus' favorite name for himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's always been phenomenal to me. It's, it's amazing enough that God would become a man to come to this earth to die for my sins. Isn't that that isn't, can you think of anything more, more imaginable than that? But the night before he did, he washed their feet. He's telling us, you want to be great, you got to lay down your life. Give it away for others. Don't you wish, don't you wish Uzziah could have had a copy of that when he was king? He might have ended up as the greatest king they ever had. Until Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you today. I thank you so much that you loved us so much you couldn't stay in heaven. And I thank you that you're not a God who seeks honor for yourself. You're not a God who wants to shame anyone. You're someone who wants to die so we could live. You want to give your life for us and then call us to live like you. Start with me, Lord, and make all of us humble. So you can use us, we pray in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks for hearing me. God bless you. Have a good week.